Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Delilah Barton. I'm the project manager for the training and technical assistance team under this fantastic BJA uh, program, the Detection and Mitigation of COVID-19 in Confinement Facilities. Um, today, we are very happy to have you join us because we have a great presentation from the New York State Sheriff's Association, uh, where they're going to talk about their partnership with the Department of Health and how they were able to reach all of the jails in the state. Um, I think you'll find it a very interesting presentation. Um, with that, we have a little bit of a trivia before we start. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just a couple of things, uh, just for information. Um, just so you're aware, this webinar is being recorded. Um, and at the end of it, we will uh, post the recording, the transcript, and the slides on BJA's project page. For those who have difficulty uh, with hearing, uh, there is closed captioning down in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that and um, put that on. Uh, also, at any point in time during the presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, post them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat uh, and we'll make sure that the questions either get addressed during the presentation or we'll follow up with you. Um, also, there should be a link that is posted into the chat right now. Perfect timing, Nandita. Uh, for everybody to quickly just click on that link, sign in to the um, sign in sheet so we can preserve it for posterity. Um, and then at the very end, we will have um, another uh, link for a webinar evaluation. So um, that's the administrivia. Next slide, please. All right, our agenda today. We're in the welcome, so I'm about to hand it off to Sarah in a moment. Uh, and then we will have the presentation from the New York team. That will be followed by a question and answer period uh, where we will also address anything in the chat. Uh, and then we'll have a very brief um, slides in the very back to talk about the training and technical assistance that's available out there. So without further ado, I will hand it off to Sarah Sullivan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanna thank you guys for joining us. We're really excited to highlight New York State as a part of this webinar series. Um, and I want to just highlight the priority that COVID-19 detection and mitigation and confinement facilities is to the Bureau of Justice Assistance um, in kicking off this TTA center. We know that we are three years plus into the pandemic. Um, and even though the um, emergency order from um, the federal government will be coming to a close here next month, we also know that there's still a large focus on this and a need in facilities. And um, so we're excited to be able to highlight this to you today. We've also heard from many of you and others in the field, both about the challenges in reaching local jails if you're at the state level, and the limited resources that are available to local jails. And so New York State has really executed a very creative approach that, as Delilah mentioned, reaches all New York State jails, which is quite impressive. So we're excited to um, bring them to you and have them share with you what they have done in New York State and see if there's any lessons from this that could be applicable uh, in your jurisdiction. So thank you again, and just looking forward to hearing the presentation. All right, with that, Bob, we hand it off to you and your team. Tom, would you start? Sure. Uh, my name is Tom Mitchell, I'm counsel to the New York State Sheriff's Association. Uh, I've had that position for about uh, 46 years. Um, also uh, on our team, uh, Peter Keogh is our executive director. Um, John Greenwald is our fiscal manager. Uh, Charles Gallo is our uh, Deputy Director and Alex Wilson is the Associate Counsel, and all of us are involved in some way or another with the with the program. Uh, there are 57 jails outside of New York City, so the grant that we received does not. You know, there's a separate grant for New York City. The grant that we received is for uh, the 57 counties outside of uh, New York City. So we have regular contact with all of our sheriffs, and I particularly have regular contact with all of our jail administrators, but we realized this is going to take, this program would take much more than what we could do because uh, we have obviously other duties with the association. So I got a call from Bob Cutita, uh, who's going to be taking over in just a minute, 
Uh, Bob was formerly a jail administrator in both Albany and Schenectady counties in the Capital District area of New York State. And then he went on to serve about 17 or 18 years, I believe, at the State Commission of Correction. And the State Commission of Correction is our state agency, which oversees all correctional facilities in New York State. So the state prisons, all of our county jails, local lockups, and even uh, youth detention facilities. So in that role, uh, Bob was a, rose to the level of assistant director there and was involved with basically every county jail <clears throat> involved in policies. And before he started with us, he was very involved in COVID management in county jails. So when Bob told me that uh, he was about to retire, I asked him if he would consider uh, taking on one more uh, obligation. And he did agree to become our, our program director, program manager for this for this. Uh, uh, grant. Um, we also teamed up with uh, Stephanie and Tim Poskin from Cleaning Management uh, Consultants and also Brent and Cero from ISSA, and they're both on the line and they'll be talking to us soon. And also uh, in with our grant comes through our State Department of Health, and we dealt with many people at our State Department of Health. It's a very, very large agency, but primarily now our main liaison there is Katie Cook, who well, again is, is on the call and she'll be talking with all you folks uh, in just a few minutes. So we meet with Katie uh, uh, on, on a Zoom call usually every couple of weeks and in person when we need to. Uh, Katie's been very helpful and all of her team at the Department of Health have really been instrumental in getting this grant off the ground and getting us to a situation where we can actually provide many services and products and, and programs for our county jails and for our sheriffs and jail administrators. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Bob Kutita, our program manager for the program. Um, thank you, um, Katie. Next Hi, slide. Hi, thanks, Bob. Next slide, please. Um, so as Tom just said, my name is Katie Cook. I'm a senior program coordinator in the Office of Criminal Justice Services in the Division of HIV, STI and Hepatitis C Prevention at the AIDS Institute, New York State Department of Health. I know it's a long title, um, but thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon to hear more about this program. Um, so overall, I provide uh, technical assistance and fiscal oversight for this uh, cooperative agreement. So I'm gonna just explain a little bit of the history on the program and then pass it over to Bob. Um, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, in partnership with the Department of Justice is providing financial assistance to ELC recipients. The objectives and the goals are to provide resources to confinement facilities for the detection and mitigation of COVID-19. Um, as it was said, this program started in 2021 and we are anticipating it ending in 2024. Um, also, as we said, the funding went to New York State uh, separately from New York City. Um, so all the work that we're talking about today is being done outside of New York City in the rest of the state. Um, so us at the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute, we're administering uh, this portion of the agreement. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Uh, so we handled it a little differently. We subcontracted with four entities due to their unique role um, with the criminal justice system here in New York State. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit of a background on those. Um, so we contracted out to the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, which is DOCS. Um, they, are, they have the oversight of our state correctional facilities and our parole system. So throughout New York, we have nine hubs and 44 facilities. Um, there's roughly 28,000 individuals within our DOC system. We also partnered with the New York State Office of Children and Family Services, and they are responsible for oversight in our uh, state juvenile detention facilities, of which there are 18 throughout New York State. We also partnered with the University of Rochester Center for Community Practice, um, to have them just develop a toolkit or some type of policy and procedure document that we could share with our funded uh, partners for the detection and mitigation of COVID-19. And lastly, and for the bulk of this presentation, uh, we partnered with the New York State Sheriff's Association um, because, as it was said, they represent the 58 elected and appointed sheriffs in New York State. 
um, our state system is very diverse here in New York. We are seeing that this week. Um, a few of us are on the road going into county jails. Uh, we were in three today. And it was just so interesting to see the difference in this state from one county to the next in our county jail system. One of the jails we were in today was built in the 1930s. So it was very interesting just to see the inside of the jail, um, how they're doing things and everybody's needs are so unique. Um, and that's why working with the Sheriff's Association has been such a positive benefit because we are able to tailor um, this program to each of the county jails and try to help them as much as possible. Um, just so everyone knows, the, large, the largest county jail system outside of New York City is Nassau County. For those of you who are not native to this area, that's the part, that little island that goes out on Long Island closest to the city. Um, and then the smallest county jail is Hamilton, which has only five beds. So as you can see, we are very diverse here in New York um, across the state. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Bob. Katie, thank you very much. So as Tom said, I have uh, over 31 years of uh, correctional experience in many aspects of corrections. So when I retired and Tom said, we have this grant, I had expressed uh, that I was not interested at first. I know the jail administrators, I know the sheriffs. And he said, why don't you sit in on a few of these calls? Um, believe me, this is not easy. Uh, I know what everyone's going through out there. Um, I spoke to some of you at the national level at the conference. Um, working with DOH in the very beginning was extremely difficult um, of their way of doing things. So we had issues with vouchering, reimbursements. Uh, it was extremely hectic in the beginning, uh, but we just kept moving forward. We ended up finding middle ground working with DOH. Um, and once we realized what they needed, or once I realized what they needed, things became much easier. We found neutral ground. And we now even travel together. As Katie said, we're on the road this whole week um, together. So I don't want anybody out there thinking this is easy. Um, the bull in the China cabinet, I put my head down and I do what it takes. <clears throat> so in the very, very beginning of this whole process, we sat down with the Sheriff's Association and we conducted several webinars <clears throat> and WebExes with our sheriffs and jail administrators. And we soon realized um, we asked them, what do you need? What do you want with this money? We realized uh, they were all over the board. Some of them wanted body scanners so they didn't have to touch the population. Some wanted radios so staff have their own and there was no cross contamination. And everyone on this call out there knows that a jail administrator can justify just about anything. So we soon realized that the Sheriff's Association, there was a major difference between wants and needs. So my job, which I took on, uh, was to find a way to get the jails what they needed while working with them to provide education on how to mitigate COVID. I also realized that this was the first time in my 31 year career <clears throat> that I could make a significant change on the entire system. First thing I did was I reached out to a colleague of mine, Brant Insero from ISSA, and he'll explain who he is in a little while. Uh, as I look past my over my career, I realized that in those 31 years, we had to deal with things like bird flu, Ezekiel virus, Ebola, and then now COVID. <clears throat> Find a way that we could get this COVID grant out, help the facilities, mitigate COVID, and also protect us from the next virus, which we all know is just around the corner waiting to kill us. So I said, how can we do this? and get the funds out to every single facility. I soon realized I needed a baseline of what's going on. What's going on with the jail in the past, during the height of COVID? What's their current situation? We had to some way come up with a needs assessment, but I had no idea what that looked like. So when I reached out to Brant, I said, what can we do with this? Brant introduced me to a great company, Cleaning Management Concepts, known as CMC. Uh, this was a company that was hired throughout the country during the height of COVID to come up with strategies uh, during the height of COVID to keep places open, such as schools, banks, large companies. I'm going to turn this over to uh, a good friend of mine, 
uh, Stephanie Poskin, owner of CMC. But before I do, Stephanie, uh, I just want to put out there to everyone, Stephanie's husband, who is also a good friend of ours and been on many travels, had emergency surgery uh, this week, uh, pretty severe, and he's doing good. But I just want to have everybody send positive thoughts to him. And um, uh, Stephanie, I turn it over to you now. Thank you, Bob. I think we're on the next slide. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. After a nice engaged cleaning management concepts as a partner, we adopted the sort of a boots on the ground uh, approach and uh, using an assessment tool based on what we learned from organizations that remained you know, operational during the COVID pandemic, um, such as those essential sectors like banking and education and infrastructure. These assessments were based on four criteria, and that was building use, access and separation, clean air, clean surfaces, and cleaning management. Um, we'll go more in depth in the tracking and trending in a later slide that Mr. Katita will um, address. Next slide. Thank you. In the first six months, we visited 48 of the 57 jails. It was determined that there was a lack of cleaning systems in place. Um, in the first, um, while the jails had policies and procedures for building use access and separation because that's the nature of what jails do there were no policies and procedures on cleaning tracking or any cleaning standards um, when looking at the product inventory to address cleaning and disinfection we found that there was really too many products um, unlabeled and expired cleaning products a lack of dilution and control systems. Um, everyone thinks they're a chemist. <laughs> um, homemade solutions that we found that conflict, it made it, um, they made it up as they went. Um, bleach and ammonia together and hand sanitizer and like homemade foggers, believe it or not. Next slide, please. Okay, I know you can't read this slide and that's okay. It was really just uh, sort of a background <laughs> and, uh, and I'll talk you through it. Um, the grant shows the why we focused on cleaning component for the grant. Um, the chart reads from left to right with the categories on the left being the most compliant with the categories on the right being the least compliant. And here's the top three of each of those categories. Um, most of the gels had limited or controlled entry points. They had reduced exposure by limiting movement and they had appropriate PPE. Most of the gels did not have um, policies and procedures on cleaning, appropriate cleaning skills, or objective um, in cleaning standards. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about what uh, objective cleaning tool is. Um, we introduced an ATP meter and swabs. And an ATP meter, um, it measures what you can't see. It just doesn't tell you what it is. Um, it just tells you that there's something there. And let's just be clear, you don't want anything there. Um, it gives you a number that measures the cleanliness. And uh, if you're looking at the chart now, you can see that effective cleaning numbers um, from the ATP meter swab is 499 and below would be in the green. Um, what needs improvement, um, which would be in the yellow, is 500 to 999. Ineffective cleaning are numbers that are over a thousand and above. Um, and what we saw was 100% of the jails had more than one surface in the red zone. So over a thousand. Only 8% of the jails had one or more surfaces in the green zone. Um, the dirtiest surfaces, let me see if I can get this number right, was 3,800, no, 385,893 on that ATP score and the clean, the cleanest was 185. And both of those surfaces uh, were in staff break rooms. So one very much in the red, way past the red <laughs> and one um, very much below the green. So it tells you um, again, what's not on it, but what is the count? Um, so we knew at this point we needed to rethink clean. And uh, with that, that's the next slide. We pass it off to Brandt. 
So before Brandt takes over, we were we had to rethink clean. We realized that cleaning was very subjective. Cleaning standards were extremely subjective. What's clean to me is not clean to probably most of the people out there. So my wife is way far cleaner than I am. This meter puts a number, a certain place and time, and what we're telling the jails to do is to just get that number to reduce. <clears throat> this way you know that you're putting in effect. So we knew what the jails had or were in, were in need of. Now it was time to teach them how to clean. Currently, we all know we take a mop, which is a cotton mop and a bucket, and we start at one end and we go to the other. We're basically just spreading dirt. I was an assistant jail administrator at Schenectady County and met Brant when he first came into this business. He started a cleaning for health program at my jail. I remembered that and I thought, how can we get this going in all the jails throughout the state of New York? SSA and the New York State Sheriff's Association worked together and we started a rethinking clean program. We worked very hard to capitalize on this. We are not mandating jails to do this, but we want them to start the program as soon as possible. We're going throughout the state of New York and we're setting up several areas for uh, the training. The surrounding jails will come in, be trained, and then they'll get a certification to go back to their facilities. So I'd like to now introduce to you Brant Insero, ISSA. Next slide. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you so much. Uh, we are so grateful to be a part of this program, Mr. Katita and the New York State Sheriff's Association. Let me start out by telling you who ISSA is, because I think that'll help paint the picture of what we do for the incarcerated population, the staff, the sheriffs, and the association. But ISSA is a 100-year-old not-for-profit trade association. And our sole purpose in existence in our education department is to educate, certify, empower the past, present, and future of the cleaning industry. And our hope is simple, is to create pathways for people to be successful upon release inside of the incarcerated population. But as we started this process with the New York State Sheriff's Association, there were some things that we didn't expect that happened. And a lot of it was based on culture. As we went through the different jails and facilities to implement this cleaning for health and certification program for the incarcerated population, we noticed that the cleaner facilities, the healthier facilities, the culture shifted. We saw infractions reduce. And we started to see staff and officers asking and begging for the services of a cleaner, healthier facility to be provided in their zones. So I'd like to take a moment and just talk simply about the process of, of, of where we're going today. First and foremost, this is the first statewide program for the local county jail system in the history of ISSA. In its 100 years, we have never done this before. We are offering this program to all 57 counties. We've launched two train the trainers so far. Out of the two workshops, we had 40% of the people that were invited to the first class attend. The second class, 100%. And right before that class, with Sheriff Smith in Montgomery County and Sheriff Craig Apple, we had one of the largest press conferences and reaches that we've ever had in the history of ISSA again. Everybody wanted to be a part of the program. And along with that, we were able to begin tying in other members of ISSA to help support this program, such as manufacturers and distributors. But the Train the Train Their program is where the magic begins. Individuals, such as staff, civilians, or officers, will take Train the Trainer and become a certified professional trainer. Upon the exit of that class and their certification, they will begin to implement training the incarcerated population. Now, the, the training elements 
are the very basics, the daily and routine cleaning tasks that anybody needs to be successful in the commercial cleaning industry. Now, what's really beautiful about this program is that these certifications are globally recognized in over 100 countries. And to date, we have trained and certified over 300,000 cleaning professionals globally. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the, the execution for you and how it applies to your agents. See, commissary funds, materials, chemicals, and all of the training support materials that you need to implement the program. And quite honestly, my favorite part of this entire process and the most fulfilling is when we receive notifications from some of our members that they've hired the incarcerated population. And these individuals have begun their career. We have seen success in the state of California where somebody was incarcerated and the next day upon release from this course, they started a new job making $26 an hour. So the proof is in the pudding. We know that the program works and we are truly, truly honored to partner with the New York State Sheriff's Association, the President of the Association, Craig Apple, and Sheriff Smith among the other 56 counties. Uh, so thank you for your support. And again, we are truly grateful. And back to you, Bob. Brad, as always, thank you very much. Next slide. So now that we know what's going on in our facilities, we're getting the equipment and the right chemistry to our sheriffs. We're starting the Cleaning for Health program. We're getting the incarcerated population out doing the work that they're being trained to do and doing the work out in the facilities, practical applications being done, what else could we do? When I was with the governor's office, one of my jobs during the height of COVID was to call every single jail in the state of New York to include New York City and get those COVID numbers. We had to do it two or three times a day. Imagine calling these jails every single day, two to three times when they are in panic mode just to get numbers. The next thing I thought we needed to do with this money was to get everybody on the same platform in the state of New York. This will be the first time New York State sheriffs will all be on a single platform and be able to track and trend COVID. I met a gentleman from BI2 Technologies. Their software, will tie into the uh, jail software as well as the medical software, and it creates a report. It allows sheriffs from around the state to see not only what's going on in their facility at a touch of a button, but what's going on around them. Next slide, please. This is just an example of the report. So Albany County, it'll give you their population, the total people that have been tested, the total people that have been quarantined. Eventually, on the left-hand side where it says Albany County, there'll be 57 county jails listed with all of their information, specific person, but with numbers. What this allows sheriffs to do in the state of New York, will be able to look at their partners and their, their surrounding communities. And if they see an uptick in COVID cases, then they start cleaning more, shutting down things, um, putting other things in place to protect themselves. We also have something here in New York State called transfer orders. Right now, if you have to transfer a incarcerated individual because uh, a facility doesn't have maybe medical or something like that or a program, there'd be no reason to call all your surrounding communities to say, hey, will you take this person? Will you take this person? They'll be able to press a button and see what's going on in those facilities and are they in crisis and not even bother the, the next sheriff. Slide. So what is our next steps? Right now we're working with CMC to conduct a follow-up survey. We wanna know what we're doing in New York. Is it working? What else can be done? And are the things that we put in place actually making a difference? We need to know what's going on in these facilities. And then we need to conduct follow-up site visits. 
We do realize though that New York is so large, it took us a long time to hit all 57 county jails. So we're in that process right now to come up with some ideas, creative ideas and working with the professionals of CMC and ISSA, what are we gonna do? We're also looking to take it a step further because again, if we can't make this something that sticks and mandates people to do this, in a couple months, years, it'll just be a nice thing. Right now, there are no cleaning standards. We have standards for everything in county jail, from when a person comes through the front door to when they leave, to visits, to commissary, to phone calls, you name it, there's a standard. There is not a standard on cleanliness. So I wanna work eventually with CDC, BJA, and the people that can make a change where if we come up with obtainable cleaning standards, we can actually make a difference in the county jail systems and possibly the state systems. And before I turn it over to questions, I'd like to introduce Sheriff Jeff Smith of Montgomery County. Sheriff Smith has been through the entire process that we developed. Last week, we conducted a training in his facility where 10 facilities came, uh, did the Cleaning for Health program. And I'm proud to say that Sheriff Smith is not only um, a sheriff in the state of New York, but he's a, he's a personal friend. And he'll tell you the truth on what's going on. And that's why I asked him to be here today to let you know what's going on. Sheriff Smith. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Katita. Um, I can't say enough positive things about this program. As the sheriff, I'm super proud of the work that the men and women do in our facility each and every day. And, you know, we felt that we had a very clean facility. And when the evaluation came out and when they came out and they, they went through our facility, to be honest with you, we were somewhat ashamed with some of the readings on that meter. But it, it brought awareness to a problem and it enlightened us on ways to do things better. And now after going through the training and partnering uh, with all these organizations, we've been educated. Uh, we've been provided the proper information and training and staff couldn't be happier. They want a clean facility. They want to work in a clean environment. And one of the most, one of the things that is imperative with this program is having an oversight committee. So the New York State Sheriff's Association does an incredible job supporting the sheriffs in New York State. We go to them for anything and everything, and they're always there for us. So the combination of them working with the Department of Health and, and the Bureau of Justice and, and getting this funding, and then, and then getting Bob Katita to come back to work to manage it and partner with the sheriffs has been a great experience and one that has been very beneficial to all of us. The training provided us with equipment provided us with certifications, provided us with education on, on what chemicals and what material to use to better suit our facility and protect our staff and the incarcerated individuals. And an added bonus is to be able to train the incarcerated individuals so that they can receive that certification. Our goal is to certainly reduce recidivism and, and to train people to become uh, responsible citizens and good members of our community upon release. And employment is a big part of that. Montgomery County is, is a fairly small county, uh, but we have a bunch of industrial work and distribution centers with openings. So it's our goal and our hope that we can get some of those positions filled with people after they've been through this program and released. Thankfully for us, uh, Hill and Marks, also one of the providers of some of this equipment is in our county. So that makes it a little bit easier for us. So we were honored to be selected and to host one of the first trainings and I can't say enough, anyone who's on this call today, uh, if they have questions, they're welcome to, to reach out. Um, I can put you in touch with the specific staff that have been trained. Up to this point, we've trained all of our Department of Public Works and our staff in the facility, and we're in the process of starting our first classes with the incarcerated individuals. So great job by everybody, great foresight, thinking about how to roll this program out. And I couldn't be more supportive and more appreciative. Sheriff Smith, thank you so much. And thank you for your support as always. Um, one of the 
things before we got a little extra time I wasn't going to get into, but I, I, I want to, I think it's important for those out there. We not only um, rolled this program out, um, our original thought was to give out 57 individual contracts. Uh, when I sat down and figured that out. I said to uh, Tom, there's no way that we can manage this. We will spend more in management costs than we will getting what the jails they actually need. So with some prodding and poking, um, the association by far does not have enough money to fund all of this stuff. We worked with DOH and what we're doing is we are doing bulk purchases. We worked with a company called BioPlanet. They have electrostatic sprayers. Uh, the chemistry kills COVID, encapsulates it, drops it to the ground. Uh, we were able to, by purchasing on a bulk rate, save the grant, the sheriffs, over $10,000. The association bought 77 of them and we had them direct shipped to the individual jails. So once we did that, we realized we have a major thing going on where the Sheriff's Association could be the bulk purchaser. We teamed up with Hill and Marks. They're giving us an enormous uh, break on the items that we're purchasing. And again, we worked with them to do all direct ship. So we're utilizing the report that CMC developed, working with ISSA to help us uh, do a kitty list of what each facility needs. We get that list approved by the sheriff. The sheriff's association pays for it. They deliver it directly there and we start the programs. So this has been an absolute wonderful way to get this done, saving tens of thousands of dollars, which just in the end goes back to the sheriffs anyways, through more products or more chemistry. Um, so I'm very proud that we're able to do that. Um, with that, I think next slide, we can go to questions. All right, well, it does not seem that we have received any questions in the chat, um, but I will go ahead and open it up to anybody on the call. Uh, if you have a question for this team and what they were able to do in New York. Oh, we do have one question. Um, the question is from Steve Conti. What are the costs associated with the cleaning services, supplies, equipment? And if over 50,000 for each individualized cost, how did you make the procurements? Okay, so... We have found, uh, and we're hearing this a lot throughout, not only the state of New York. So because this is coming through the Sheriff's Association, which is a 501c6 organization, we're not bound by a lot of the state regulations that the county jails are. So we are going in, we're purchasing it and getting it directly there. Then we get reimbursed from DOH. So we purchase everything, we uh, submit the vouchers and then we get reimbursed. I don't know if that helps answer the question, but we're finding the same issues, concerns that our county jails are having. That's why we did not do individual contracts. And that's why we're pushing everything through the association because we're not bound by those governmental rules. The only thing we're bound by is the federal rules of uh, the grants which is oversighted by DOH. And believe me, they look at every little thing. So um, we've been very, very fortunate so far. That's why we did not go with individual county contracts. Brant, I'd like to turn that over to you. ISSA absolutely can work with other ones. Brant, if you can answer that, if you can work yeah, outside thanks. of New York. Absolutely. So ISSA is a global not-for-profit trade association. So we're able to help anyone in any state, in any country, and, and more than happy to set up times to, to talk through the process with you. We have another question on what is the, oops, I just lost it. What is the timeline for each of the trainings? Does Do incarcerated individuals have to be there for a certain period to be involved in the training? So I'm going to leave that for Brant also, but one of the exciting things is, is we can actually tailor this program, um, what's needed in each facility. So Brant? 
to, to speak specifically to the training, um, you know, in Schenectady County, I'll use that as an example. Uh, that was my really, um, for, it was my first time inside of a jail ever, to be honest with you. And uh, the experience was amazing. Uh, and, it, and the corrections hold a special place in my heart now because of that experience. But um, that being said, we designed something that was a total of 32 hours in length, knowing that the county system had the highest turnover in the incarcerated population. So we didn't have them for a long period of time. So we had a total of 32 hours, which was classroom instruction, as well as the performance-based application, with the whole intent is to have the incarcerated population helping to clean and maintain the facility through, um, through the process of the actual course. Um, so think of it almost as like an, an internship where they actually have to show proof that they've learned that information. Now we have some uh, county systems in, in, in state prisons, uh, DuPage County, the Federal Bureau of Prisons work with us as well. Um, and, and they will actually take a course and lengthen it based on their population. And some of them will actually go four to six months long um, before they turn over and have another class. Uh, as, and one other thing just to note on that, the class size is also critical to the success. Uh, most organizations will limit the class size to 10 or less uh, incarcerated individuals. Um, another question, does CMC work with each jail to create a cleaning and ATP testing schedule? How are you making this a collaborative training opportunity and something that is non-punitive? That's a great question. And uh, what we're doing with that is it's all part of the training. When I'm out there and we're doing this, um, part of our package that we're giving to each facility is an ATP meter. And we let them know that it should not be punitive. It is not meant to say you didn't do your job because the ATP meter only shows a moment of time. So if someone just ate, there's obviously gonna be um, something there. There's gonna be residue. So we try to explain to them during the training when to do the readings, where to do the readings and be consistent. We are trying to work eventually to have these readings uh, sent back to ISSA and then have them track it so that we can give them better feedback. The problem with that is the grant money is gonna run out and I haven't figured a way to really do that yet. Um, so that's why we started these cleaning for health programs in New York state. We have something called the commissary account. It's where the uh, population purchases things. It goes into an account specifically for them. And the money of that account has to be for them for the benefit the incarcerated individuals. So when we started this program, we're trying to work out the aspects of um, continuing money and how do we continually, you know, because uh, someone on the other end has to keep track of all this. Oh, great. Um, the next question is, did you have to modify the original work plan submitted by your Department of Health in order to institute the program? Um, we worked very, very close with DOH, our Department of Health. Um, believe it or not, when we started, I don't know how everybody else is, but it almost took us a year to even get money um, gated. So when I first started, I wasn't getting paid. It was just something I believed strongly in. Um, so I took almost six months with no pay, just crashing through the idea of what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do this. I knew eventually the pay would be there. So I worked on this plan, um, I would say for probably six months, and then it took another six months to actually get money rolling. So uh, it, like I said in the beginning, it was not a great uh, experience, but I believed in what we had. And again, this is the first time in my 31 years in corrections that I knew there was this bulk of money that, to be honest with you, I don't think the feds want back. So we have to spend it. And I want to make a change. So, I mean, my whole life has been corrections. All right. And a final question that we have right now is uh, about the, the BI2 um, COVID tracking application. Are there plans to use it on a routine basis for reporting other communicable diseases to the public health? So that's a great question. And it is something on in my sites um, because the grant is specifically for COVID. Um, only dealing with COVID right now, but that doesn't mean that I'm not having backdoor discussions with my Department of Health to monitor and 
sorts of things. Um, you know, anything that has to be reported to DOH now, we could report through this. But I've already talked to the to BI2. They're willing to make the changes, but it can't be paid for through the grant. So I have to find other funding. Uh, and, and my department, of, um, now that I have contacts with them, they're they're working with us. Delilah, I'm one of these guys that once I find something, I just keep going. You know, I'm oh, a pit bull. <laughs> No, that's fantastic. Um, all right, any other questions uh, for this team? Well, if anybody has questions that come into mind, you're welcome to uh, email us. There's uh, there's going to be contact information um, actually on the next slide, I think, as well um, for the team in New York. And then there's another contact information at the end of the slides. So if you have follow-up questions, I'm sure that uh, these guys will be happy to respond and, and uh, get back to you. Um, with uh, any information you guys need. Um, all right, well, with that, thank you so much for that presentation. It's fantastic. I think it's been um, very uh, helpful and it's interesting to see how the other you know, different states are, are, are tackling this problem. Um, so thank you for your time today and, and coming out and presenting that. Um, can we move to the next slide? All right, so um, one thing I will point out uh, is that you know this webinar and uh, this whole process is part of the uh, joint CDC and BJA uh, training and technical assistance program. So we're very happy to uh, bring this kind of information to the field and to you guys who are interested in hearing more about how other people are, are tackling COVID uh, within the confinement facilities. Um, and with that, you know, we wanted to just give you a couple of different slides just to talk about the TTA resources that are available. Um, we have uh, a team of um, coaches and experts who are available to assist. Um, right now, our four coaches, Bob Lampert, Wendy Kelly, Kathleen Moore, and Dr. Uh, Jennifer Clark, um, they are our coaches who are working with Liz uh, Raystrick and um, uh, Betty Gondals, and they are reaching out to all the different recipients and uh, doing some baseline needs assessments to see where everybody is in the program and to see where they need to go and what support they need. Um, we did want to provide a link here where uh, you can put in requests for training and technical assistance. Um, so please, you know, if you have questions or requests or need some support, we are here to help. Uh, just reach out to us and we'll get back to you uh, in, uh, through coordination of the program itself. Um, next slide. So there's just, these are just a couple of examples of the support that our team is providing. Uh, we are uh, addressing questions on um, the guidance for using the available funding, um, uh, working with CDC on that. There are opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and learning. Uh, we're doing webinars such as the one that you've just uh, participated in. Uh, we are currently in the process of looking at some train the trainer um, uh, curriculums to be developed. Uh, and we're, we've actually got a, a huge cadre of uh, resources that we're going through right now and pulling together to, you know, have for the coaches to provide out to our, our uh, recipients out there. Um, and then we have many subject matter experts. So if you have a question, just ping it to us and we'll do what we can to uh, uh, address your, your questions. Um, next slide. All right, so um, do we have a participant feedback link? Is that in the uh, chat? Yes, so um, Nandita just placed a uh, link so participant feedback from this webinar, we greatly appreciate your comments to help us improve. Um, always about continuous improvement. We wanna make sure that we're providing you the content and the information that you guys are seeking. So please take a moment to um, complete that. Uh, and with that, um, Sarah, I'd like to hand it to you for any final comments. Thank you, Delilah. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to CNA for putting this on and for the technical assistance that you provide. Thank you to the folks at New York State, both the Department of Health, the Sheriff's Association, and others um, for sharing what you've done. Um, as Delilah said, this webinar series is a part of um, the 
COVID-19 Detection and Mitigation and Confinement Facilities TTA Center um, that is managed under BJA. And so we're just delighted that you all are here. And please make sure that you send an email to the CNA folks so you are included on future communication about upcoming webinars that happen. So with that, just thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Delilah. This was awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob.